You're now listening to Mixed Mental Arts with Brian Callen and Hunter Motz. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Mixed Mental Arts. And uh, we're recording in a very special and very exciting place. We're here at the Institute of Quantum Information and Matter at Caltech with longtime friend of the Brian Callen Show, now Mixed Mental Arts, Spiros Michalakis. Spiros, welcome back. Hi, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the greatest compliment that I've ever received. I have been mistaken for Brian Callen. You look hot. <laughs> How many quantum physicists do you know who would say you look hot? To me, um, you really have to be in some sort of other dimension to be looking at me and thinking that I look hot. Sorry, I take you back. That's, oh, that's Hunter. Oh, my God. I feel terrible now. <laughs> yeah. So, Spiros, give us a little rundown, because I believe that last time that we saw each other, this place was called IQI. That's right. So, um, some time ago, uh, John Preskill, the Feynman Professor of Theoretical Physics here, and a good friend and rival of Stephen Hawking, the one who actually won the bet against Stephen on this black hole information paradox, um, he created this center here almost like over 10 years ago, where some of the best uh, minds trying to study quantum information, quantum computing, came through as, either as graduate students or postdocs, and mm -hmm. now they have become leaders in the community around the world. And at some point, uh, his experimental friend, uh, Jeff Kimball, decided that it's time to, to break the seal and to join forces between theory and experiment, because we might as well just try to create the quantum technology of the future, including quantum computing. And uh, we have IQIM now. There is the matter part where we also uh, study exotic properties of matter or exotic matter itself that we haven't seen before exist. And we get to synthesize and create it and play around with it. So turning theory into practice. That's right. And usually it goes through different steps where you have people like me with are more like mathematical, mathematical physics background mm -hmm. being more out there, right? But then there are people that are more theoretical physics and they come a little bit closer to being able to speak the language of an experimentalist so right. they can create a model through which they can explain whatever the experimental scientist is seeing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, even the experimental side, you can go a little bit further and towards quantum engineering. Mm -hmm. and that's when you're starting to make stuff that actually matters to people. Right. right. So, so yeah. a faster computer because it's a quantum computer. Exactly, or, exactly. Or some amazing like quantum metrology type of thing that allows you to have like GPS with 10 times the accuracy and so on. Amazing. And so Amazing. So, and I, you know, we, uh, we just had lunch and that lunch went on for three hours. Um, that and was a Greek style, lunch, <laughs> a Greek you know? style yeah, lunch. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, I think one of the things that I learned in that lunch, you know, cause there's, there's a process of discovering all the many sides and mysteries of Spiros, but something that I don't think that I'd appreciated before was the degree to which you're kind of an outsider in this community because you're coming from We'll go ahead. Yeah, it's, uh, it is a little bit different for me. I came from the mathematical side of things. Um, and indeed, you know, somebody who is working in quantum information or, um, you know, also, I guess, what is called quantum gravity. Mm -hmm. uh, this is usually the purview of some serious uh, theoretical physicists who have a PhD in physics, right? Not in mathematics. And for me, with a PhD in applied math, I can speak the language now as a mathematical physicist, but mostly I would I would try to prove stuff. Mm. Right? That's not usually what a physicist does. A physicist, a good theoretical physicist, for example, creates a model and they hope that it is good enough for somebody else to take notice and try to destroy it. Right. right. And by destroying it, give a birth to a better model. Right. And so on and so forth. For me as a mathematician, I want to go directly to like the foundations, right? Mm -hmm. The axioms, understand those, understand if I can destroy those, right? And from there build something stronger, a whole like, you know, foundation for the theories that will be developed in the future. And so that outside perspective means that you question things that have sort of become cultural prejudice or That's... that people haven't thought to question yet. Yes, yes, which is, uh, it's wonderful <clears throat> to be able to do that. And it is very powerful, I think. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to poo-poo the other side where, where they're doing like the very important work of creating and destroying these toy models, mm -hmm. right? Which gives someone like me enough of like a pattern, so so a data, so I can see the pattern, right? So I yep. can have some pattern recognition and say, okay, we keep seeing this everywhere. And then all of a sudden, even the more sacred cows, right, of Einstein and Hawking and Feynman and so on and so forth, 
they start like you know falling apart because you end up seeing the bigger picture and as a mathematician i can maintain i guess both you know the existence of the axiom as mm -hmm. a self-evident truth and its opposite right at the same time and create different emergent structures from from either perspective see when you told me this what this reminded me of is there's this great uh story that comes out of eli Lilly, the uh the pharmaceutical yeah, company yeah. where um they had certain intractable problems certain problems they couldn't solve within eli Lilly, no matter how hard they tried no matter what they did so they decided to just trust in the wisdom of crowds and so they put these problems up on the internet and offered a bounty for anybody who could figure them out and what they found, which was very interesting, is, is that it was never people within the field who solved it, but always people in an adjacent field who had enough understanding to be able to wrestle with the problem, but they didn't have the same sacred cows. They didn't have the same assumptions. And so therefore, they could look at the problem in a fresh way. Yeah. And there's something else also. It's not just that, um, you know, they didn't have to go by, play by the same rules as everyone else. Mm -hmm. They're like, this is what you do. You do string theory, you do quantum field theory and curve space time, this kind of stuff, right? It's not just that you can zoom out mm -hmm. right? it's just that when you're in an adjacent field you have tools that have not actually been used so far yeah right? because you can imagine like you know when you have smart people thinking about these difficult problems it's not difficult for a smart person to say okay what if i start thinking outside of the box that's what right. we try to do all the time so like what if i don't take this seriously but if they don't have anything to to substitute right this new concept with right they're stuck they're like okay i need to go back and keep digging Right. right. So it is like, you know, it, it is very synergistic. I love mm -hmm. that word, you know. <laughs> so, it's a yeah. great word. <laughs> one of the one of the best uh, things in 30 Rock was there's this uh, Tina Fey, right? Liz Lemon's yeah. character. She and her team want to go and uh, they want to find an excuse to go to Miami. And so they're trying to convince Alec Baldwin's character, Jack Donaghy, that they should be able to go down and, you know, go to Miami. And so she delivers a presentation and the presentation goes, China internet synergy <laughs> <laughs> jack donaghy is like that's the best presentation i've ever seen because <laughs> you just use all the buzzwords yeah, yeah. um <clears throat> but i think the yeah the, the interesting thing is, is that of course you know for a lot of our listeners this is very much the same thing as mixed martial arts where you know there's a problem where you've got a guy who is you know the preeminent fighter no one can take him down right. and then somebody is incorporating new tools so they're incorporating jujitsu they're incorporating you know again like I'm just sort of really getting into the fighting world so I don't fully understand what like the analogy Bruce Lee, is right? and Jeet Bruce Kune Do. and Jeet yeah, Kune Do, yeah, yeah, which yeah. we talked about at lunch and you're not taken seriously by the way when you start doing that you're not a pure right mm -hmm. there is like you have if you don't pay tribute to the tradition yep. you know they don't take you seriously and there is always that balance and mm -hmm. i think there is a good reason why you shouldn't be taken seriously until you have paid your dues right yeah. because very often you end up with crackpot science because you haven't seen all the good things that were tried and didn't work mm -hmm. or some like you know things that didn't seem like good ideas but they did have a start maybe 30 40 years ago but they didn't have the next step. Yep. Maybe you should just do some literature review before you just say, ah, everybody missed this, right? There's a lot of smart people throughout history and maybe they didn't put the, you know, like the dots together the right way, but you can be that person once you have the, a good idea built upon their ideas. Right? Well, and even what Jose was saying at lunch, which very much fits with the diffusion of innovations, that very often the answers have been sitting around in the literature for 30, 40 years and nobody has ever applied them or they haven't connected those dots, like you're saying. Yeah, in, uh, in, <laughs> in physics, there's this joke that uh, the Russian physicists figured out everything like, you know, 30 years ago. <laughs> Whatever it is, they already, which is so true in many yeah. ways, right? It is incredible. Um, and this goes to something else that we we're discussing that you have sometimes these hubs, right? These like, you know, places of like, all of a sudden you have a lot of talent appearing, mm -hmm. right? Out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And it seems to all be concentrated around some geographical location and you're wondering what's going on. And it's usually some amazing mentor or mm -hmm. teacher or somebody who has a vision. And then the students, the pupils become the masters of the future. That's right. right. So this is pretty amazing to, to see that there's very strong component of culture within like science itself.
Yeah, because you get these talent clusters. That's what Dan Coyle calls them. And the example that he gives is the Spartak Tennis Academy, in uh, oh. which is the tennis academy that turned out Anna Kornikova. And then all these young Russian girls saw that that was possible for them. And yeah. then, you know, Sharapova and all those yeah. other Russian female tennis players have all gone through this one place. And again, they figured it out in the sense that they know how effective practice works. They know that what you want to do is slow it down. So they actually have them play tennis without rackets and without balls and have them just move their arms incredibly slowly to make sure that the stroke is exactly right. Um, And so that's the thing is is that, you know, the the opportunity, I think, for, you know, humanity in general, but then more specifically for the mixed mental arts community, is to break down what that looks like and then to much more intentionally evolve better and better culture that we can then disseminate with the world. We can take it back to our companies, to our families, to our countries, to, you know, our academic disciplines. that's possible um, because you know for whatever stories I've heard and people I've talked to that are successful in their field they usually have the same kind of background yeah and it's not even a pedigree mm-hmm. right oh did you come from some fancy Ivy League place yep like Harvard you know or like Harvard. oh was it MIT <laughs> you know whatever yep. um, it, I guess it's more about the approach right mm-hmm. do you have a mentor Mm -hmm. or a team of other like peers right Mm -hmm. where you just go goonies in the Mm -hmm. world right where you're like we're just gonna do this Mm -hmm. right you just go nuts and you're having fun and you're innovating and you're getting wisdom right Mm -hmm. either from like your friends or even like you're getting your own inspiration from time to time or the mentor right right? because the mentor has both a fast and a slow approach where Mm -hmm. it's a boot camp when mm-hmm. it has to be a boot camp and other times you go slower so like you have to have patience mm-hmm. right you have to really be contemplative here you have to do the work mm-hmm. you can't just always like you know be running 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 right sometimes right. in science actually to do good work you have to stop right and take note of what you've done so far take mm-hmm. stock like you know just understand all the the work you've done right create like a mental foundation even a skeleton and then say okay now i need to like you know go full throttle again right? see what i love about conversations with you is this that i call you brian is that you call me brian and for a moment i get to feel like i'm as famous as and you know as ageless sorry brian. as brian callen <laughs> what i also love by the way is is that brian you know we've been joking that you know mixed mental arts is good isis as i said and that yeah. you know we're building the callen fate um, oh my goodness. <laughs> but what's great is, is that already in terms of building that cult, you know, even when Brian's not here, we still have to talk positively about him. Of course. <laughs> the one supreme being. That's <laughs> right. He's always watching. Brian is always watching, always judging, always making sure that we're on message. <laughs> um, but so, you know, but no, but what I love is, is that, you know, uh, the most satisfying conversations and, you know, when you find people like this, it's that w- there's just this, you know, this brilliant yes ending where, you know, you are talking about, for example, now you're talking about, um, you know, the dynamics within what an effective tribe looks like. And I hear everything that you're saying and I'm like, oh, he's talking about Pixar. Like this is Ed Catmull's Creativity Inc. Yeah. And it's the spirit of 76 and it's the it, the emotional climate that existed in the you know first four centuries of islam where it is that spirit of discovery and wonder and there is the you know there is that seamless it's the undoing project of kahneman and tversky it is that seamless transition between fast and slow thinking where the group acquires this intelligence where they're able to really figure out yeah. you know what is needed here and there's something amazing that happens when either as a scientist or just as a human being going through life you get beaten down so many times, mm-hmm. right? Because you say you started with some idea of how the world is supposed to work, mm-hmm. right? Or a hypothesis about how the universe works or something. And then you try it out. And if you have this intellectual integrity, which mm-hmm. I think is important and very difficult to have as a human being, <laughs> yeah. right? When you, know, you get beaten down again and again, then you end up finding through some weird way like you know your path to to enlightenment Mm -hmm. in some way right where you get to see a truth Mm -hmm. that was almost nothing like you expected it to be Mm -hmm. but you couldn't even imagine how beautiful it would be Mm -hmm. that's why right and when you see what is really out there Mm -hmm. then you incorporate that immediately and you say wow Mm -hmm. you know i'm glad i didn't tell everyone like what i really thought was the truth and now i know and you play it cool but every time Mm -hmm. that i have been wrong I have been wrong 
because the truth was even more beautiful than what I right. intuitively expect. Right. Right. And it made even more sense afterwards. It connected right. more things than before. So. And I think this is a great opportunity to talk about what science is. And I think particularly one thing that I think is, you know, something that, uh, you know, uh, Atul Gawande has this great uh commencement speech, The Mistrust of Science, that he delivered here at Caltech. Yeah. And, you know, I think one of the, the most powerful things in there is, is that what he's really talking about is a journey of becoming a scientist. Right. It is not an accumulation of facts. No. Right? As a human being, you're always stuck with that mentality. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you're trying to fight it as much as you, you, you can with that intellectual integrity aspect. Mm-hmm. But it is not about accumulating facts. Mm-hmm. It, that's only good to just get you to the next place of recognizing a new pattern yeah. so that you can evolve, right? You can expand, I guess, the sphere of the, the theory what you had for the universe, whatever it is. And it is actually, I think, like science is the best tool we have to figure out the truth, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it is in some ways, um, and this is coming from a scientist, right? It will never really get to the truth, truth, right? So what do I mean by that? Okay. It's not because of something that is really kind of wrong with science. It's just because the way I think of truth is more of a probabilistic, mm-hmm. right? You know, statement versus yes and no, right? It is something that we consider it true because we have seen it so many times mm-hmm. and all the, the exceptions, right, are so rare, or maybe we've never seen them, that what we do is we don't just say, okay, 99% probability that the sun will, will rise again tomorrow, right? We say 100%. Right. Okay, there's just no other way. The same thing, like, you know, with a lot of other things, right? You know, you're, you're right across from me, Hunter, right now, right? It's but, true. But there is some probability in this quantum universe that you could just disappear, Mm-hmm. in the next moment right or like you know alien comes out of you and just <laughs> eats me all right yeah. at the macro world though i wouldn't be able to tell the difference until it happened right right so we create this illusion of truth as being a spike in probability space right that everything else is not just very unlikely it is impossible mm-hmm. so what we do is what i call truncate mm-hmm and then renormalize, meaning mm-hmm. that like we completely forget that anything else is possible. Getting a hundred heads in a row when you flip a coin, right? That's impossible, we say, because we would never see it. Right. It would take forever and ever until one of us actually got this to happen. So as scientists, we think like we've never observed it. It doesn't exist. You create a theory that not only says this is very unlikely, it says this is excluded. You have to fit the theory, right. with the data that you have, and you over parameterize sometimes. It's almost like machine learning you end up like overfeeding the data. And then when something new comes up, yep. like quantum theory and the double slit experiment of like, oh, particles going through two slits at the same time, people like Einstein lost it. See, the the, the thing that the listeners are really missing out on, the, the unfair advantage that I have is the amazing Greek hand gestures. <laughs> I can't help it. Yeah, you know? Spir- Spiros I talks both his it. mouth and his hands. And there are graphs being drawn. <laughs> things are being truncated. <laughs> probabilities. Too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, but I mean, just to sort of really break that down, you know, there are, we forget that those unlikely events are not impossible. Exactly. Right. And it is very easy to, again, and as I was saying with this coin flipping experiment, mm-hmm. right? And you can try it at home. Try to flip like a coin and get 30 heads in a row. Right. Right. You may even get lucky enough to get to 29, but then you get unlucky. It's 50-50 kind of like at the end. And then you have to start all over again. Right. And, you know, there's an expected number of trials you mm-hmm. have unless you become really good at flipping a coin, right? And you bias the probability. But expected is like, one over the, uh, that small probability, yep. which may be like billions of times. And then you just either give up, mm-hmm. right? Or if you're a scientist, you waste your life down that rabbit hole, right? Until you get it. Right. And then by learning how to get closer and closer to it, you engineer reality. Mm-hmm. You break reality and engineer it to go to something away from what we call normal. Right? Uh-huh. In the normal sense of a distribution, you go away from the median, right? Mm-hmm. The average, what you would expect would happen if you were just flipping randomly a coin. To do this, that's what science is like to me, right? It is this um, this endeavor of humanity to use controlled explosions mm-hmm. to recreate reality in ways that would not just happen 
on their own, right? So the, I think the, the key thing here for me, and this is something that, you know, uh, very much like a Tool Gawande's piece, and if the listeners haven't read it, I strongly recommend reading it, is that, the, you know, as a, when you first are exposed to science, you have this idea that it is about this accumulation of facts. And so, you know, you go around and you memorize the Krebs cycle, and then you go around and you show off, and you've, you're very impressed with yourself, and you spend, you know, a, Gawande spends all of his time going around, he comes home from college, college and he proceeds to tell everybody where they're wrong right and how yeah, he's right yeah, yeah, yeah. and you know the he has this great line in there which is that the scientific mind is an experimental one not a litigious one and so a litigious one just means litigating like a lawyer where yes. you're trying to Either find false, false and exactly. true or false yes. And the experimental one is the one that Spiros is emulating for you, is demonstrating for you, where what you're doing is, is that you understand that you have different ways and different models and different, essentially, stories, because that's really yes. all these models are, that you use to make sense of reality. But it's but the, the difference is, is that these stories, they have different functions. And some stories are good for some things, and some stories are good for other things. So yeah. to take this from, for example, a you know um, a biochemistry standpoint well we have a story of disease that centers around germs and that's a big broad overarching story and it makes sense of a lot of things but sometimes we need more precise stories where we start talking about bacteria versus viruses and then we need even more precise stories where we start talking about different kinds of bacteria or different kinds of viruses and we may need to get more precise where we start to think about you know what are is your genetic heritage and how does that interact yeah, you nailed it i mean this is um um, and I've been talking about this uh, to anyone who will listen, that even within the field of theoretical physics, whenever we talk about the theory of everything, right? Mm -hmm. I, f I think of this as a misnomer in many different ways, right? One of them is that I don't think that there is a theory of everything. Right. Because everything includes also complete randomness. Mm -hmm. it includes like, uh, you know, watching your TV with, with a cable unplugged, where mm -hmm. it looks like static, Right. right. If you try to create a theory of something, it means that it has some predictive power. Mm -hmm. It is compressible. Right. So you don't have to keep in mind all the data to be able to predict the next one, mm -hmm. the next frame. Right. You know, so, mm -hmm. for example, there is a theory which we call a plot for a movie. Right. That looks very different from like static. Right. Right. So one of them can have a theory because it's compressible. You can almost predict what will happen in some good movies or, you know, they don't have too many twists, but you have much less possibilities in the future, right? Right. So you can write a synopsis, mm -hmm. right? That's what the theory does. You have some input. The theory tells you kind of like what the output is, that is expected. But for randomness, that's impossible, mm -hmm. right? By definition, like what we call Kolmogorov complexity. There are some strings of zeros and ones that cannot be compressed. There is no program, right? Mm -hmm. For example, the string 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and so on and so forth is very easy to compress. There's a very short program, much shorter than the string itself, could be a million, like, you know, little bits, that says, okay, if you're a 0, then flip to a 1, and so on and so forth, and right, vice versa. And that's a very small program. That's very compressible. That's a theory for that string. But if you have some random string that is incompressible, mm -hmm. and there exists as strings, you can, like, you know, prove, right? They, you need a program as long as the string itself to describe that's that string. string, yeah. Meaning, like, to describe every future beat, like, of information. So, so if we, so to, because I think the other interesting thing, too, and what you've unpacked there is, so if we are, you know, let's put side by side, right? And we can even call this the Spiros problem or the Michalakis problem, right? Spiros. Uh, the, the Spiros, Spiros problem Spiros, is what yeah. you like? Yeah. Michalakis is like, you know, <laughs> just a longer, longer word. Well, it just has far less More chance of becoming <laughs> popular, right? <laughs> <Okay>. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, the, yeah, the Spiros problem where. You know, what what theory would we need to predict the, you know, the plot of a movie versus what theory would we need to predict the, you know, the pattern of static on your TV? Yeah. And to predict the plot of the movie, we'd be interested in human psychology and we'd be interested in, uh, you know, the culture. And, you know, we need to know what was, you know, Hollywood thought was hot in the moment and, you know, what what are likely endings, you know, the writer, the director, their sort of you biases. You can do actually better than that. Yeah. Forget even about that. Let's do machine learning. Okay. It's artificial intelligence, right? Where mm -hmm. what you do is you give you know, the computer, right, mm -hmm. or the human or the critic, a thousand movies to watch, right. all from the same genre, 
right? Mm -hmm. And then what they do is, for some reason, they fit the parameters, and it makes complete sense what is going to happen next. Yep. Even if it is a twist in that movie, they've already seen another one, yep. right, where it wasn't, and so on and so forth. So they can they can extrapolate. Right. The problem with static is that it doesn't matter how much of that you're given. Mm -hmm. It will always be random. There is no way to compress and predict by its very nature. Mm -hmm. That's the definition of like, you know, randomness. There is mm -hmm. a, a Dilbert, I think, cartoon where it's like there is a little random generating monster that they use at the office and it just says like one, 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 right? And so the boss is like, uh, how do you know, right? You know, that this is random. It's like, well, that is the nature of randomness. <laughs> no, no, but it's not true. We do have, right, you know, methods, as I said, mm -hmm. like the complexity of the string. Is there like, with respect to some resource theory, is there a way to compress it to a smaller program that can give you the rest of the string, right? You know, mm -hmm. whenever you ask for it. For example, the number pi, mm -hmm. right? When you think of the digits of the number pi, they seem very, very random. But right? they're not. They're not at all. There's a very short mm -hmm. program that can give you the next digit, like, you know, within a, a millisecond. Right. Because it comes from a geometrical, like, an approach where there's an algorithm. Right. Very brief algorithm. So that's the amazing thing, right? Our concept of randomness is a bit skewed. Mm -hmm. To go back to the, you know, the idea of a theory of everything not being possible, right? It's because it does have to explain stuff that is purely random. So that's impossible because it cannot compress those by right. definition. They're incompressible, right? So you cannot just write it in a book and say, ah, and that's the next like, you know, frame you're going to see on your TV of this completely random gibberish. Well, and also I think the other interesting thing where, you know, the, the theory of everything idea breaks down is what we were also talking about, which is the idea of practicality. And that even if, you know, uh, you could have a single theory of everything, what you would find is it's very much like the Newtonian and Einsteinian mechanics yeah, yeah, thing yeah, where, yeah. you know, one is useful for cases that are far from the speed of light and one is useful for cases near the speed of light. Or even worse, you could say like, okay, if the foundation of all physical reality is quantum physics, right, why is it that we don't use that to actually learn how to drive, Yep. right? Well, uh, that was Professor Stephen Hawking. Uh, he had a question that he needed Spiros' help with. Uh, so it, it was quick. You know, <laughs> there was like, you know, some issue with his radiation around the black yeah, hole yeah, the horizon. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, you know, we can fix that. It was amazing how quickly Spiros cleared it up. <laughs> it <laughs> None of this is true, by the way. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we were discussing about, uh, the, I guess, the nature of... Uh, of truth and the theory of everything, right? You know, and also the practicality of it, right? Yeah. Why don't we use, why don't, don't we need quantum physics to learn how to drive, right. right? Or even to do biology or to do chemistry, right? You know, so, and it does go towards something you said earlier. Uh, it has to do with something also we call here in physics universality. That as you go from one level of reality to the mm -hmm. next one, right? As you're zooming out, because we think often of quantum physics as zooming in. You zoom in and it is, you know, the, lo the laws of and the rules of physics at the smallest scale. That's not quite true, right? right? There's something else going on here. Quantum physics permeates everything. It is supposed to be how the universe works at all scales, including like planetary, intergalactic and all that stuff, right? So the question is, why don't we see some of the weirder aspects mm -hmm. right, of these rules come to bear? Right. Why why don't we see Earth like split in two and just like, you know, interfere with itself and then like, you know, go towards the sun, explode with the sun and then start all over again. Or I mean, you know, you're saying that Spiros, but at the beginning of this podcast, I did turn into Brian Callen and that then is, turn back. That was a was... quantum moment right there. <laughs> I was like, oh, my goodness. You know, like I didn't pay enough to have Brian stay here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think like this is a very salient point very important point to make that it is not about the theory of everything right even about like you know the the marriage between quantum field theory and general relativity quantum gravity as we call it right to try to to put together gravity very like important force for our lives but very weak relative mm -hmm. to the other like you know weak and strong nuclear forces and then electromagnetism it's not even about that it is about understanding that even if we had that theory that wouldn't help us fall in love any better. Right. Or like when you break up with someone, it wouldn't feel any better. Right. You know, and the right. reason is because there are different theories of everything. Right. There right. are different theories for different levels of emergent reality. 
Right. You know, there's the reality at a smaller scale. And even then, I don't think there's even a basement. You just keep going and going. It's almost like a mathematical fractal structure. But as you move up from that, right, then you start thinking about quantum chemistry. And quantum mm-hmm. chemistry may be important for you if you're trying to understand how to beat cancer, right? right. Because at the biological level, like it's almost like you're, you're trying to understand society, right? You know, but without understanding humans, right? But the or key, understanding economics. The key thing is that the theory of everything is a sexy piece of marketing. Of it's course. a really cool idea. I would say Stephen Hawking is brilliant simply because of that. I mean, he's, yeah. he's a really smart guy, but just even thinking that you have to brand it in some way, yep. right? Like you could, you know, you you can get a lot of people to mm-hmm. listen in when you say, oh my goodness. A theory of everything? even yeah. a part of the theory of everything, I would be so powerful, <clears> right? <throat> not really. No. <laughs> I'm not a billionaire. Right. Despite being like good at these things, but you know that's because the theory of everything does not even help with well, like you, you know some other stuff. And right? you can't you know? do surgery. Exactly, I cannot do surgery <laughs> and then like you know not go to prison. I right. could do surgery, <laughs> but you know, it could be a problem. And in fact, if you do want surgery done and aren't too fussy about the results, <laughs> Spiros will be operating out of IQIM. Oh my goodness! Don't <laughs> sign me up for that. <laughs> Um, but that's that's the key thing is is that I think that you know uh, people who actually do science you know they think about a series of related tools right these are these are tools you can bring to the problem you know there's an understanding that you know uh, people in adjacent fields so you're a mathematician you come in you have a new set of tools to bring to the problem and you had this great story that you were telling me about Einstein oh yes like you know that has to do with like you know the myth of genius right mm-hmm. and to me that that is important because I spend a lot of time also doing outreach and one of the things i see is that the barrier of most human beings to to say to wanting to ever be a quantum physicist or a mathematician or somebody who like you know thinks for a living right about that stuff is not intellectual it seems that it is to them it is emotional right Mm -hmm. it's because like oh no i'm no einstein right because look the picture of this superhuman super brain it's not, you know, it happens one in a million years, right? And and even if that were true, right? Even if you were to say, oh, yes, all the models, the super models that you see, like, you know, magazine covers, they really are that beautiful. They're never photoshopped, which is bullshit. Of course they are, right? Even if that were the case, who is to tell you that you cannot, like, you know, elevate yourself to that and even beyond? Right. Right? It is a matter of, like, having the path and the tools to get there and beyond, to overcome where they couldn't. There's and a lot of problems that Einstein could not solve that now we, we, we solve like, you know, routinely, which is insane, right? You know, it is that evolution of building upon other people's like structures, right? And so that, that really gets down to, we've talked a lot on this podcast about, you know, Joe Hendricks, the secret of our success and cultural accumulation. And there's this phenomenon known as the Flynn effect, which is, is that worldwide across cultures, IQ goes up over time. And that's, you know, if you, the, the that's sort what of, we tell ourselves, that's you know? what we tell ourselves. Um, but there's this, you know, one of the, the great things in there, I think it's, uh, if you took the per average person in America and I think 1815 and you gave them an IQ test, a modern standard IQ test today, yeah. it would score 70. So they would be borderline retarded. And that's because the cultural software has gotten better and better and yeah. better and accumulated. And the, the, you know, if you compare someone like Newton to someone like Einstein, you know, by the time you get to Einstein, the tools are much more sophisticated. The culture is much more sophisticated. And what you're saying is, is that even like today, there are problems that physicists are yeah. able to solve. But it is also, I think of it as a matter, uh, as a matter of like velocity versus mm-hmm. position. Right. Because mm-hmm. you can imagine like, you know, it is the derivative of position. Right. You're looking for something that that changes with time. Right. Mm-hmm. And how what is the rate right. at which you produce something? Because, sure, you know, Newton was no Einstein relative to the theories. But at the same time for his time, he was even bigger than Einstein in some ways. Right. You know, relative mm-hmm. to what he had to, to start with. Right. So revolutionizing his own way. But even then, what we don't tell each other really is that there were a lot of other people that did a lot of the legwork, right? For Einstein, he was a mathematician who actually helped him beat out another top mathematician, David Hilbert, before, like, you know, he could come out with this, you know, general relativity equations, we call the Einstein equations now, that bring, you know, space-time curvature with gravity, right? So he needed help, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't say that because he's Einstein, 
you know when there is some nice articles that end up like you know bringing this up more recently but but you want to have this romantic idea yeah right you know of of like the michael jordans of the world and the the steve jobs and the einsteins and the only problem i have with that is that it is not a good way to actually get things done mm -hmm. by getting things done like you know my agenda is not just to inspire right but to after like you know i tell you okay this is what step 10 looks like in your life how do you get from step zero where you are to step one exactly and that's mentorship right that yep. takes like a lot more than just saying oh you could be like this person that's right that's much harder because you know, if you're already you're very motivated, passionate or talented for some reason or another in some, you know, particular field, you don't need me. Right. You're just going to do it because you figure it out on your own. Right. But what about the ones that are not, that didn't have this, like the, the culture, right? You mm -hmm. know, that says, no, you can do this. This is also interesting. This is exciting. Right. You know, there is value in this. And you're thinking, no, this is not for me. It locks you up emotionally, right? You don't, you don't want to... And so on a personal level, Spiros, why is this so emotionally, personally significant to you? Well, I think that I have seen, I guess, around the world, and, you know, I grew up in Greece, I've told you, uh, Spiros only comes from, from one country, <laughs> and I saw so much potential mm -hmm. in my classmates, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in my fellow Greeks, and then I came to the U.S. Uh, right after high school. And then I was in a culture that was almost opposite of that. Mm -hmm. I was at MIT and it was just insanely innovative and it was playful. And it was about this sense of like playful discovery mm -hmm. to the point that you wouldn't sleep. Mm -hmm. Not because, you know, you, you had like stuff you had to do. It's because you had stuff you wanted to do. Right. You wanted to learn how to build robots and at the same time study like anthropology and like, you know, computer science and mathematics and all that stuff. It was just so amazing. Like somebody it was like Willy Wonka. <laughs> yep. Chocolate factory. You, you want everything. Right. And to see that there is like such a like across the pond, you know, yep. there is such a big difference in certain places. I don't get why it is impossible to recreate that sense everywhere in the world. I don't think it is impossible. And I think that's precisely, you know, that's the journey that we've both been on from different angles and from different perspectives. And the possibility is, is that by coming together and evolving mixed mental arts, we can do that more effectively than we would do on our own. Yeah, I hope so. And it is like up to to people like us to realize that it's not just pointing the finger and saying, you know what, you know, I did it. You should do it now, right? Mm -mm. It's about reflecting upon our own journey. Yep. Like, how did we get through periods of time when we're like, screw this, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm terrible at this, right? You know, I'd rather go and do something completely different, right. tangent to this, right? Who was there to help us? Mm -hmm. Was it something in eternal, right, from, from within? Was it something that came from a, an amazing mentor? Right? Was it institutionalized in some way? Is it possible to do this? Right? And so I do believe that what you guys are doing is important because if what you're we're like, doing, you know, well, sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to help, like yeah. in some no, way. We're, but, we're, but I think we're, this is great. So. We're yeah, we're pulling you in. I mean, you know, you you can Damn try. <laughs> you're a black hole. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's no escape. You've crossed the event horizon. Amazing. <laughs> um, but I think yeah, I mean, I think the the, the key thing is is what you've said about path. And, you know, that's part of what we were talking on before, uh, you know, during our lunch, I took Spiros and Jose um, through the Culture Matters videos. And that's really the key is, is that, you know, you need these short videos that can get people into the world. And then you can go read a 500 word blog post that's fun and digestible. And then you can go watch some of these cultural confessions that we're going to be doing where people are going to be sharing their own cultural stories. Yeah. And then, you know, you can work them in and if they want, they can go read the books or they can go read the stories but that's that's what our society i think does so poorly yes yeah, path i think this is really great that you yep. have laid out a path and as we discussed uh over lunch you know to me i said like my favorite heroes mm -hmm. are the anti-heroes mm -hmm. right are the ones like humphrey bogarts of the world right where despite themselves they do the right <laughs> thing Right. You know, they're not fake. They're not wholesome. They're not this or that. Right. You know, they 
they have their own issues mm -hmm. they can acknowledge them right or maybe they don't even there are issues they cannot even acknowledge what their issue is but somehow at the moment of choice they do the right thing yep and with these knowledge bombs that you guys are like thinking of dropping like you know the world i think this is great because it's not just a tool for you to show off no right to be like oh wow you know look at this thing i have become enlightened because i can see both sides of this issue but this will still somehow separate you right mm -hmm. if you don't do it right from the other side the ones who have not watched it right mm -hmm. you know the ones who have not thought about it in that way the ones who are still stuck or trapped or whatever, right? And then furthermore, it could be worse. Maybe there are people that even watch it and say, yeah, screw it, I don't care. You know, I still like this. I still like Shiracha, even though it will eat me alive from the inside, okay? I don't care. You know, I'm going to be honest, guys, right? You have to respect and accept that. Yep. But I do think that, you know, this, this process, right, of even putting it out there, making it like, making people aware of it, mm -hmm. that's that's the last like bastion of humanity it's not whether you're right or wrong it's whether you have some integrity whether mm -hmm. you're going to own your own convictions right are you going to be hypocritical and say no you're wrong but i'm right on exactly the same issue but just like yeah you know it's just a different taste like oh no 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 vanilla is terrible it's all about chocolate right <laughs> you're like wait how you know like let me explain it to you right like, yeah so it is very important to start having these conversations and a sense of humor, I think, is very important, especially when you want to punch the other person, right? Instead of, like, <laughs> hug them. But, you know, it, it, it is that the way that you guys are thinking of doing it. I'm very excited to... Be a to part of it. And be a part of it, That's yes. correct, um, um We've actually... In PG-13 and <laughs> up. <ways. laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, Spiros has a very special role planned out. Oh, goodness. Uh, there may be some nudity involved. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Mom... Don't listen to this. <laughs> but I think the, you know, I think the key thing for me is, uh, you know, what you just talked about in terms of the experience of being in Greece and realizing that, you know, there's there's really no fundamental difference between you and those other kids. And then also between those kids and the kids at MIT. It's just a certain different set of circumstances, different environment, different culture, yeah. different set of possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that, you know, has been my experience growing up around the world, Brian's experience growing up around the world. And at a certain point when you realize that, you know, there but for the grace of God go I, right? Like if the roll of the dice had come out slightly differently, yeah, yeah. I would have been in a very different place. Then you start to realize that, A, uh, you have a responsibility to use the advantages that you've been given to uh, democratize that knowledge. Yeah. And then also, crucially, I think that, you know, it's actually in your self-interest to democratize that knowledge because your ability to solve problems is limited. An individual can only do so much. That's Science is a collective right. issue, yeah. you know. And, and so, you need diversity of perspective. Exactly. Not just because it's the right thing to say. That's right. Because it works. Yep. Because you may be stuck hitting your head on the wall mm -hmm. on something that like your neighbor who looks That's nothing right. like you or even doesn't think like you right it's like oh you mean like this thing you're like oh my goodness it's like that yep. moment in the movies where we i kind of hate we're like wait, wait wait what did you just say yeah right the person who is not the genius right exactly you know, gives the answer is like oh my goodness and like okay you're welcome right you know but that is actually true this happens all the time yep. and very often as we were saying before say you're working on the theory of everything right you know and you're stuck you're siloed within your own axioms within mm -hmm. your own what you think is the foundation right mm -hmm. the basement and then somebody else comes along and says that's not the basement right that's the third floor okay like this is how you go like you know lower and they're like whoa okay this is very interesting show me some of the tools and the reasons why you're saying this let's have a conversation you wouldn't have that. You'd be stuck there forever and ever trying to, like, you know, smoosh together two theories that do not want to be smooshed together. You so just shouldn't do that. I hope that you guys are excited because you're about to get the inside track on the bleeding edge of physics from Spiro. So you had this great thing that you told me about lunch where there are these two different theories that That's most right. people are just trying to put together. There's quantum field theory. Yep. Right. And then there is general relativity. Mm -hmm. So quantum field theory is what a quantum physicist considers the holy grail right you know this is what we use what we call the standard model to understand particle collisions to predict what particles exist like you know once you have at the large hadron collider collisions happen to say okay we just 
So a Higgs boson, an mm -hmm. excitation of the Higgs field. So quantum field theory has to do with the idea that there is such a thing as space-time, three-dimensional space plus one-dimensional time, and on top of that blob, right, we put what are called fields, mm -hmm. which can be either what we call scalar, where you just have on top of every point of this of this space-time, you have a value, like almost like a topographic map, right, a specific height. Uh, or they could be what we call vector fields, where you don't just have like a height, you also have a direction. Mm -hmm. yeah, you can think of when you have these like magnets and, you know, you have uh, some iron filings or something like that. And you put a magnet and you get to see them align. That's kind of a magnetic field, right? So you have electric field, magnetic field. You have a Higgs field, the one that couples like, you know, to, to particles that travel at the speed of light and slows them down and gives them effective mass, right? Mm -hmm. This kind of stuff. But the idea is from the quantum field theory point of view, that world is quantum physics, you know, and to understand gravity, you have to go to general relativity. Mm -hmm. This is Einstein's theory where he says that, okay, this space time that we use to put fields on, it has a specific structure. Mm -hmm. right? Distances are measured in specific ways. And moreover, there's something beautiful that happens here that says gravity is an illusion. What it really is, is a curvature in space time. Mm. Right, whatever that blob looks like, wherever like you know it dents in or goes up or whatever, you can think of it as an effective acceleration. It's as if like, and I like to explain it this way: if you think of gravity, gravity is an acceleration, right? You're falling faster and faster and faster, like mm -hmm. towards the Earth or whatever it is. You're like bending towards it. How would you get acceleration, right? If you have a constant speed you're not like you have, you know, how, that many meters per second. You're just traveling at specific, like, I say meters because I'm Greek, but, you know, feet, whatever you want to say, yeah. right? You know, it's the SI units, so I think I'm right. <laughs> but anyways, so you're moving the, at you the constant the international, rate. The international system of units that is international, except for America. For America. <laughs> That's right. Hell yeah. That's America. Right. That's right. <laughs> so, so, you know, if you think about just moving at constant velocity, right, without any acceleration, you're not like, you know... Uh, pressing on the gas then what's happening is you're traveling for every second the same number of meters right mm -hmm. so what if you cannot actually like you know travel faster and faster what if instead what happens is the dimension of time ends up folding or falling towards these dimensions of space mm -hmm. so it has a shadow over these dimensions of space that shadow you can think of as an extra 0.2 seconds per second for example, depending on how much it falls, it curves towards like the dimension of space. So what happens relative to the person who does not have this extra like 0.2 seconds per second, mm -hmm. you get to travel further than them because you have more seconds per second than them. That's it. Acceleration is just your ability to, to manipulate like space time to get more seconds out of every second of somebody else. So you're saying that that motion. So I'm in my car. Yeah and I'm driving at the speed limit for the record, Yes. <laughs> um, that what I'm doing is is that I'm actually bending space-time. Well, you know, something like that. But yeah, if you, yeah have or, a, if you have something that is an acceleration, this is more of a chemical, like, you know, yeah, yeah, reaction yeah, yeah. And stuff. But if something's bending towards the Earth, yeah. right, what is happening is that the Earth is bending space-time. Yeah. The matter field of the Earth so is these bending. Are all like, those, you know, that, those are those pictures we see where the sun yeah, is sort right. of sitting on a diaphragm and there's a divot exactly. around it. And yeah, then yeah. light and everything else is kind of like kind of rotating around that's it. That's right. Like they're staying round. Right. Not, right. You know, that's that's the gravity that yeah, the yeah, planets yeah. feel. And that's kind of the idea. But, but you know, the, the, the main point is that because of this bending of right. the direction of time, Right, because they're no longer different. Like you know, time and space, you place them on the same object. Mm -hmm. It looks like as if you were to draw it out, it would look like some weird four-dimensional blob. It's difficult to do that in three dimensions, but you can imagine it almost like a movie, right, from a right. point of view. But because of that bending, it's almost like you're compressing. You're you're moving faster through some frames than other ones, mm -hmm. right? As you're like more seconds per second than, mm -hmm. than somebody who's just playing it at the right speed, right? And that gives you the illusion of like accelerating relative to somebody else who's just not doing that, who's just right. moving one second per second in their frame of reference, as we call it. Right? So, 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 so we've got these two different models. These are the two different theories of the universe at the smallest scale for quantum field theory, right? right. The fields and the smallest particles, and at the largest scale, which is general relativity. Right? We're talking about space-time. There is like a beautiful equation there that couples the 
the metric, as we say, of space time mm -hmm. to so the curvature to the matter fields, right? right? You know, how much matter do you have, the mass and all that stuff, you know? So it kind of tells like, you know, one tells the other what to do. So those are the two fundamental theories and they work really well in their own perspective regimes, right? Where we measure stuff. But when we try to bring them together to create this unified theory, the ground unification of the forces, right? Of gravity from, gra uh, from GR, as we call it, right? General relativity. And then from these weak and strong nuclear forces and electromagnetism, which all come beautifully together from, you know, some nice theories on quantum field theory side, mm. right? When you try to smoosh these two balloons together, they explode. They give you infinities. Right? So I think, I think that just to break this down and, you know, go back to uh, my A-level physics, right? So there are these, there are these four theories there are these four forces in the universe. Yes. And even if we go back before that, right, so electricity and magnetism were seen as separate. Separate, yes. And then Maxwell succeeded in unifying that's them, right. and that's why you have electromagnetism. Yes. And so what ends up happening is, is that this one, now now what was two forces now is one force and explains all sorts of things. It explains magnetic behavior. It explains electricity. That's it right. explains light. It explains all sorts of things. But yeah. then there are these other forces. That happen like at the at the level of the nucleus exactly right? you know what is holding the nucleus together mm -hmm. right what is holding the protons mm -hmm. right you know that you have in the neutrons in the nucleus right what makes them seem indivisible even though there's like quarks if you go deeper and so, right. on and so forth right so these are like the 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 weak and strong nuclear forces and the the power i think again because you always just have to make it clear like why is this practically useful it's practically useful because as you understand electricity then you get to have electronics and as oh, you yes. understand for example general relativity is important in being able to do things like gps that's right um so all of this the and more also space travel and without it right yeah if we didn't have the the equations of motion to take you like from here to mars you'd be so far off if you did not actually account for uh, for uh, the curvature of space time that you would end up somewhere very far away i didn't know that oh yeah that's, yeah. that's you know it's just if somebody gave you the wrong map yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You're, go you're going straight for five miles and you end up somewhere very very bad it's kind of like when apple started like you know doing maps <laughs> <laughs> you end up like a yeah. beach or something because but, you know. but the so even so you know newtonian mechanics which is you know the the f equals ma all of that yeah. first second third law that doesn't work for space travel that's right and it's not enough because it's the not further enough. you go for small distances it's good enough you mm -hmm. can almost see where you're trying to go right and correct but where you go further and further you have all these other effects that come from like you know space time being there curved you go. itself and you need to care of them. Right. That's the same reason why GPS would be so far off. You'd be like a mile from your destination, from where you're supposed to be, uh. if it wasn't corrected for this, like, you know, for the true theory. Say. So that's a really great example of these models being useful for certain situations. It's, you know, because obviously Newtonian mechanics is much simpler, right? There are far fewer variables. There's far less to account for. It doesn't for. feel that way to any student in physics. <laughs> As but, a graduate but, or not. Yeah. But, but, I mean, you yes, know, everything, right. yeah, yeah. Everything, is, everything is hard when you're first doing it. And then when you've been doing it for long enough, it becomes easy with practice. Yes. That's the nature of automaticity. That's right. Um, but the, the, so even that, you know, in order to do many of the things that you're needing to do today, like having a GPS system, having ways, you know, you need uh, general relativity. So the, but, the, but I think part of, the, part of what the world doesn't realize is that that's all on the back end. So yeah. you don't see that the work that people like Spiros is doing is making the modern world possible. Well, thank you. That's very nice. But I feel always so very far removed. Mm -hmm. um, and you feel removed from the technology um, in time. Mm -hmm. Because whatever theory I will help develop or my colleagues here at Caltech, we actually take pride in being useless for the next until like, you know, maybe 30 years from now, because we're seeing far enough into the future right. that if we weren't doing that, nobody would be doing this. So right. It would be like Google or IBM or somebody else is looking to do things in the 10 year mm -hmm. right, you know, time frame. We are looking 30, 50 years. We're looking at the far out stuff. But Not you have far to... off in the future, but far out. And they, of course, if we're good, we end up like pollinating things that are happening over the next few years actually right, right. making a big difference so i'm seeing it even here in quantum computing right now some of the theories we're developing whether it is quantum error correction right you know some uh, related fields they end up having a huge impact 
on almost like the weekly meetings that the higher ups at Google or Microsoft or IBM, right? You know, what are we, should we scrap this like and do this new code that uh, yep. they just came up with in academia? What, you know, what is the hottest thing? What is the one that has the least amount of resources we need and like, you know, the, the easiest to do mm-hmm. and still achieve the same result? And we are here doing that at the same time that we're doing the really far out stuff. And that's that's the key thing is being, you know, that you need somebody to break that path and to be pushing the bleeding edge yeah. so that the world can be then catching up. But I think also part of what I find interesting as well is, and you tell me if this is true or not, I don't know, but I for a long time have felt there, there's a real disconnect in between, I feel like physics has a good pipeline to engineering and uh, there's a terrible pipeline in a lot of the rest of science. It's not as good. People aren't reading, for example, you know, the, with education. That's obviously a lot yeah. of what my background is. And just, you know, so much of that science isn't then being applied in the classroom. It's not being implied to make better schools or make the, the, the teaching better. Yeah, um, that's... Um... I would say even in physics, this is an issue, right? Because unless you are um, an experimentalist, mm-hmm. right, and you're theoretical in any sense, it's going to be difficult for you to jump into an engineering, right, or some other more experimental uh, field. It's hard as it is to do it in academia, let alone when somebody pays you good money and expects stuff from you, right? You know, so, uh, but I do think that it is really valuable mm-hmm. to have these individuals that are bridges that can bridge these two worlds right and whenever you have them i think um actually john preskill my mentor here at uh, caltech he calls these individuals two trick ponies right (laughs) yeah where they have more than one trick up their sleeve right uh and whether they are theoretical but they can bridge two different like you know theories together right or uh fields or maybe because they are just at the right place between theory and experiment or experiment and engineering, they're super valuable, right? Because not only can they do stuff that others cannot do, right? But also they are among the very best people to communicate what the hell they know, right? From both sides, because an engineer will not have the language to understand like, you know, the experimental science from the basics point of view. Right, from a more fundamental point you, of view. You could call a two trick pony a mixed mental artist. Oh, snap. It's still um, a pony, though. So, it's still yeah. a pony, yeah. Uh, or just, Super you know, cute. A, a mixed mental artist, if one is ever achieved, uh, will, <laughs> will, will, will be a pony with so many tricks that it will become a unicorn. Okay, there you go. <laughs> You've been listening to Mixed Mental Arts with Brian Callen and Hunter Motts. For more information and past episodes, please visit briancallen.com and mixedmentalarts.club. Also, be sure to follow the show on Twitter at Mixed Mental Arts. Until next time, bye-bye.